um, we'll kind of see how this goes. And if you guys want more information, we'll give that to you. So, um, so the topic is stress management, turning stress into happiness, kind of giving you some tips, some different ideas that you can do with that. Um, and if you guys have questions during, even at the sites, feel free to type in and ask some questions. So, okay. So just to begin with, what is stress? So here's just some different definitions. So the first one, stress means to draw tight. So that's kind of like the physics background, meaning like if you're drawing tight, like on a rope or something that's being drawn tight. And it can also mean loss of emotional control, inability to cope with problems, um, absence of one's inner peace, a perceived threat, whether, whether that threat is real or imagined, um, any change you encounter in life. Um, the person who was presenting this said, any person who likes change is a wet baby. <laughs> That's the only person that you can think of in the world that likes change. They want to get their bottoms changed. So, But any change does cause stress most of the time. Um, and this was a definition. Um, when the demands placed on you exceed your ability to meet those demands. So you can think why that would cause stress there. Um, so the top sources of stress. So these are the top four sources of stress. We have money, work, economy, um, and family responsibility. So money is the highest with about 69%. Work is about 65%. Economy causes for about 61. And family is about 58%. And there's a few other things rambling off on there. But again, those are the top four of people studied. Those are the biggest things that do cause them stress. Um, and also studied, they found that females actually are more stressed than males. So females have reported having higher amounts of stress than men. Um, but on the side note, women feel that they're doing enough to manage their stress. And women might be more likely to report it, while men are going to ignore it. Which might sound good, saying that they don't seem like they have a lot of stress, but by ignoring it. And you'll come to find, once we explain this more, ignoring it is one of the biggest problems of having stress. So females have more stress, but men, you guys ignore it, which isn't good either. So. Um, so just some interesting, interesting statistics there. Okay, so stress on the brain. So they've been doing a lot of studies, a lot of research lately showing what stress actually causes or what the causes of stress are. Um, some people think if you're stressed out, it's okay, you can manage it, you'll get through. But stress has a lot, a lot of um, causes on the brain. So the main thing is it can shrink the hippocampus by 3%. And that hippocampus, the main thing the it does for the brain is impacts learning and retention. And when they've done MRIs and studies on people with Alzheimer's and dementia, that's the first part of the brain that's being affected. So stress is a big deal. Um, and the good thing is it can get back to normal size by exercising and eating well. So they're starting to find out if you do have, um, if your brain is affected by it, you can begin to build new brain cells. And I'll kind of start talking about that again, how you can build new brain cells, just from doing some simple things there. Um, drugs, so another statistic here. So this is trillion, so 325 trillion, 800 billion dollars on prescription drugs a year. Um, that's across the United States. 10% of that was on anti-anxiety drugs, so for stress, like Xanax, prescription drugs. And these drugs are only band-aids. They do actually nothing to, to reduce the stress. So they may make you begin feeling better, but the results that it has on your body, on your brain, is still happening. So those drugs are kind of hurting the population as a whole here. OK, so statistics are done. Now let's talk about what stress causes, actually. So over, unmanaged stress causes overeating, weight gain, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, insomnia, depression, relationship issues, and it also causes your wounds to heal slower. So again, stress has a lot, a lot of impacts going on in the body. So why does it matter in the workplace? If you're stressed, why do you think it should matter? You're working, you're still getting your things done on time. What's the big deal? 40% um, of 1,300 or 1,000 employees reported leaving their job due to high amounts of stress. So People in the workplace aren't able to keep their jobs because they feel that they're under high amounts of stress. Um, the American dream, whatever happened to that American dream where you want to succeed, you want to be the president, you want to be the CEO. Well, 73% of people said they don't want their boss's job. They don't want it because they see how stressed out they are. They see all the complications. They see everything that comes along with it. And they say, I don't even want that. But the American dream used to be, again, you want to succeed, you want to do this. But stress is kind of inhibiting us to where we don't even want those great things. 
So in the workplace, high amounts of stress causes poor decision and bad judgment, diminished customer service, um, and a loss of innovation and intellectual capital. So your employees aren't going to be working as well if they are under, under stress as well here. Um, also can do unresolvable conflicts, diminished teamwork, more frequent accidents, more mistakes, workplace violence. So I have a video that we're going to show about workplace violence. It's pretty comical. So you think, again, stress at the workplace, no big deal. Well, this In is what happens. In these economic times, it's not just the unemployed who are stressed out. Even the people with jobs are. Take a look. What's new in the world of 9 to 5 will make you want to call 911. YouTube makes it look like the American workforce is on the edge of a nervous breakdown. Workers of the world rising up against infuriating workplace oppression. The tyranny of bulky computers, paperless printers, and annoying co-workers. We all bring baggage to work every day. Now, many of these videos are fake. Some are clever viral marketing campaigns. This is really an ad for office chairs. But all these online videos tap into something real. Let's call it cubicle rage. There's a lot of frustration in our society. What is it all about? The rewards of economic gains have gone, as we all know, to fewer rather than more people in society in general. And when people perceive inequity, they're likely to feel angry and they're likely to want to take retributive steps. Dave Heiner worked in a well-known video game chain store in New York. A co-worker captured his state of mind the day after Christmas 2009. Heiner says he was joking, sort of, but he says he truly had had it with the customers and his manager. Dave has now moved on from that job. This video went viral on the internet. Here comes the new computer monitor. And there goes the new computer monitor. For some disgruntled parcel delivery people, everything is airmail. But why is it that grown adults can act like children in the, in the office? The workplace is a powerful social situation, so we come to react to each other as if we were pseudo-siblings. The workplace can be a big happy family, or the workplace can be a big dysfunctional family. Okay. In so, these economic oh, I don't times, it's not just... How do I get out of the media escape? Yeah. Sorry, let me find my... Oh, there we go. Okay, so again, you can see, I mean, those were a little extreme issues, but stress is on the rise, especially in the workplace where we're under demands for making sure we make money, making sure we provide for our family. Um, you know, stress is causing people to be a little bit more crazy than what they used to be. So it is an important issue, and I think um, they made a comment to us, too, that where we are with stress management right now is where the United States was with smoking cessation in the 1960s. So stress continues to be on the rise and we're just now kind of at the brink of it. We're just now realizing again all the effects it does have on the body. So um, there's a Japanese word that actually was just created about two years ago. Um, the word is kuroshi and this word means dying from work. So if you have a heart attack, a stroke, or if it, even if the employee committed suicide, um, these families can get money compensated to them because work was the cause of their individual to pass away. So it's, I mean, it's a changing, changing thing constantly here. So, okay. So two different kinds of stress. Um, there's acute stress and there's going to be chronic stress. So the acute stress, um, I have a picture down there. If you think you're driving in the car, all of a sudden you see police lights go on behind you. You feel that heart, you, your heart rate just starts pumping. You start sweating. So that's kind of the acute condition. So it increase, increases blood pressure, heart rate, lasts about 20 minutes. Okay, chronic stress is more of an ongoing thing. This could last for decades. Um, you won't notice it as much because you don't have that quick onset all of a sudden, but it's going to result in tension headaches, loss of sleep, depression, et cetera. So that's kind of the one that is causing a lot of chronic conditions for people. Um, so you guys have all heard of fight or flight, okay, in biology, in ninth, 10th grade, in high school, um, this idea of fight and flight. So it's Something comes on, all of a sudden, you're either going to fight that situation or you're going to run away from it. Okay, but actually, our bodies haven't really evolved the way that we are currently living. So fight or flight was good back in the caveman days, for example. Like, so say if a bear or a lion or something was running at you, you're either going to tackle that bear or lion 
or you're going to run away from it. But it's not always um, appropriate anymore. So if a, car po a cop pulls you over, if you fight or flight, you're going to get arrested and you're going to be in big trouble. So instead of fight or flight, um, our mind has developed a freeze state. So when we freeze, it's that mental paralysis, okay? Um, you find you can't make decisions properly, you feel overwhelmed, and that eventually is going to lead to burnout. So lead to people quitting their jobs or not getting depressed, not wanting to wake up in the morning just from freezing from having that stress because our bodies don't know how to handle it. Because we can't fight or flight most of the time. So. so the physiology of stress, what happens, there's outside stimuli. Um, your body decides if it's a threat or no threat. Your amygdala in the brain has an alarm that goes off. If it, It's telling you if it is a threat, the alarm goes off there. So epinephrine or norepinephrine is released in the brain. A neural impulse is then sent to the body to do something. And that neural impulse, for an ex impulse is an example. Um, when you think or when you imagine you feel something or you think you hear your phone vibrate, we constantly check it without even thinking about it. So that's kind of the brain sending that neural impulse. You hear something, oh, I've got to check my phone. So that neural impulse goes really quick through the body. Um, the adrenal gland, so this is a stress gland. This is where the epinephrine and the norepinephrine is released from. Um, it releases all these steroids, the gluco glucotoroids, I can't say that word. Um, and it also releases cortisol, which is a huge role in stress. And you'll see kind of why that's actually a bad thing. So it's called the stress hormone. Um, it increases your heart rate and blood, blood, blood pressure, sorry. Um, increases blood glucose levels for energy and increase your serin lipids, which is great for short-term use, but long-term use, not so good. Okay, so what happens to the body? Immediate effects, we kind of talked about that, what happens right when you get stressed out. But the prolonged effects, it increases your thyroid gland activity, increases your cortisol activity, which begins to destroy our white blood cells, and it will begin to decrease your immune system. So again, it's good right in that heat of the moment. If you're stressed out, you've got to do something really quick. But over time, it's hurting our bodies, OK? So long-term effects. If you get increased blood sugar levels full for a long time, people are going to get diabetes. Okay, increased serin lipids, going to get coronary heart disease, okay? Suppressed immune system, cancer, autoimmune diseases, et cetera, okay? Um, the association between stress and disease is huge. So they say it's about 80 to 85% on the conservative end. So, I mean, cancer, obviously, there's no cure for cancer right now, but they're seeing, again, from stress, by researching and studying it, there are lots and lots of ways to be able to prevent that. Um, and this is a new thing that's actually coming out. Um, these are called telomeres. So a telomere, everyone has chromosomes in the body, okay? About 23 pairs of chromosomes. On the tip of each one of those chromosomes, okay, there's four telomeres on each tip, or on each chromosome. Um, and they protect the chromosome from damage and destruction, okay? And these are actually anti-aging cells. Stress, they've been finding, has a huge impact on telomeres. It starts to make them shorter, okay? You see the short, one who has a short guy, he all of a sudden looks old and withered and not looking too good there. Um, short telomeres account for 10 to 15 years off of your life. So stress is one of the main contributors, again, to shorten those telomeres. So if you live a stressed out life for zero to 65 years old, your lifespan's kind of coming close to an end there. So, but they have found you can lengthen the telomeres. Okay, so exercise, sleep, diet, so if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I've been stressed for 40 years of my life, what am I going to do? There are ways to shrink or to lengthen them. Um, they also found most physically active people studied had the longest telomeres. Okay, so they're going to be the ones who are going to have the longest lifespan there. Okay, so here we go. Best strategies. Okay, there's relaxation techniques, which at the end of this, we're going to do a little relaxation. That's why you guys came, right? To actually get relaxed and get calmed. Um, there's some different coping skills, which we're going to talk about. Um, and the one thing is exercise, OK? I know you guys hear this a lot. It's kind of one of the most common things you hear about. But exercise is the number one symptom. Oh, sorry, exercise. The number one symptom of ex of, I can't talk. The number one symptom of stress is muscle tension. There we go, OK? So they want get out and exercise, OK? If you're feeling tense, you're feeling like you don't really want to move, exercise and actually helps flush out all those stress hormones. So from getting stress, all those hormones, all those stick, those glucoteroids that are getting put into your body, exercising helps flush those out. 
um, even if you're not losing weight, those hormones are still getting out of your system, okay? So all those, again, those hormones that are causing diseases, causing cancer, causing coronary heart disease, just by simply exercising, you're flushing them out of your body, okay? Getting them out, getting them moving. So exercise, we know the benefits for exercising, losing weight, feeling better, but getting those hormones out, all those stress hormones is another big thing that they're just now starting to realize is a huge deal. So really important there. Um, so anger, people who are really stressed tend to have a lot of angry as well. Okay, so anger is the fight of stress. So in the fight or flight, anger is the fight. Um, anger happens when there's an unmet expectation 10 times out of 10. Okay, so any situation you can think of, if you get angry at your husband, it's because he didn't take the trash out or it's because he wasn't nice enough to you on your birthday or you, same, you can say the same thing for your wife, coworkers, they didn't do a project on time that you were hoping they'd do. Everything happens, it's always because of an unmet expectation, okay? Um, there's different types of anger. There's a somatizer. This person never gets angry and you think they're the nicest people. But if you see them behind closed doors, they have like TMJ, like lockjaw. They get autoimmune diseases because they're keeping all that anger and keeping all that stress in. So they're getting cancer, MS, Parkinson's, okay? Um, there's an exploder. You stew for a while before you explode. Um, a self-punisher. You have guilt, overeating, retail therapy, um, even like um, eating disorders as well. And there's an underhander, someone who wants to always get even, okay? If you look at this list, more than likely you're gonna be able to say, I'm that one, or I'm that one. Everyone's one of these things. Um, so, anger is an okay thing, okay? You're supposed to get angry, it happens, but you wanna get it out. But they say, this is an idea that you can try to do. Create a tickler notebook, okay? So every unresolved issue we say is a control issue. So to kind of help combat that, they say create this tickler notebook. What it is, you try to find one thing humorous a day and put it in this notebook, okay? Laughter is a really good medicine. So this is just some pictures that I found. This baby's really excited. It's the weekend's coming soon. Um, and this other one, the awkward moment when you realize you don't have a cat. Cat's all of a sudden on your chest and you're screaming because you don't know where this cat came from. So just silly things, okay? I mean, videos, if you find, it doesn't have to be um, like a notebook per se. You can even make like a website or send yourself emails and kind of keep it on a Word document. But again, when you get angry, combat that with laughter, okay? Laughter really is a great medicine. The brain doesn't even know the difference between a fake laugh versus a real laugh. You still get the same benefits. You still get those endorphins running through your body even if you're just fake laughing, okay? So laughter is a huge thing. So this tickler notebook I thought was a pretty neat idea. Um, you'll be surprised if you're really angry or really upset, going back and looking at that stuff, just laughing for a little bit, you'll see the anger just goes away. Um, okay, so here is a stress pre prevention model. Um, it's called the Porter Stress Prevention. Um, one of the doctors down in the conference we just went to in Colorado Springs, he has created this model, okay? The old way to manage with manage stress was, here's a stress ball, just squeeze it. Keep squeezing it, you'll feel better soon. That's not working, obviously. Taking pills is not working. So he's created this detailed prevention model, okay? And there's six pieces to it. You wanna assess, activate, avoid, appraise, attune, and accept. Um, but these are just building blocks, okay? So the order doesn't necessarily have to be in this order that I have here. It can be different for every person, okay? So we'll just jump in. Um, and this is where I'm gonna kind of, I'm giving you this very briefly. Um, we had, this presentation was one whole day worth was going over this whole model. So it's really in depth, really good information. But again, just for sake of time, we're gonna kind of brief it down. But if you guys have questions, feel free to jump in. Um, so assess, the first thing is assess. So the main thing is you wanna determine um, the amount of intensity of stress that you're currently under. Okay, so figure out, is it, an acute condition, is it chronic? What's causing the stress and how intense of a situation it is? Okay, and it's important just to view stress as a part of a journey you're on, okay? Everyone's gonna encounter stress at some point or another through their life. It's not the end of the world, it's not, but if you view it as a journey and realizing it's gonna stop, you're gonna get over it, it will help you conquer that a little. So some different ways to do it, measure, okay? You wanna take a stress profile, um, and we have a, Online on our personal health profile for our employees, there's a stress section that will kind of help you assess your stress. But there's lots of other stress profiles out there. You can find some of it on the internet. 
go in and take some and it kind of just again determines how, how much stress you're currently under. Okay, you want to monitor that stress, write a stress journal, okay, write stuff down, get it down on paper, figure out again why you're stressed, what's going on, what's happening. Um, and the next thing is set goals, okay. If you set goals for yourself, again, it's going to help you, you kind of need to get on a bridge. Okay, so give yourself that little piece to get one into the next. Put that little piece there for the bridge. It will help you get to that goal. So figure out what goals you want to accomplish. Figure out where you're trying to go. And it just helps your mind kind of situate everything a little bit better. Okay, the next thing is activate. So you want to activate the powerful sources which build resilience. An example of that is that one song. I get knocked down, but I get up again. I'm not going to sing the whole thing, but you guys know what song I'm talking about. Um, he gets knocked down, he gets up again, you're never going to keep me down. So that's resilience. That's something happens, you fall down, get back up and try it again. Keep doing it, okay? Um, and ways that you can build that resilience are having a healthy diet, making sure you're getting enough sleep at night, making sure you're exercising. So those are going to be the keys that are going to help you build that resilience to where if something happens to you, you're not going to be, you're going to be determined to get back up and try again. You're not going to want to stay down because you're going to already have those good things going on in your life, okay? Um, avoid. So for avoid, as simple as it is, stop doing the dumb things that might cause more stress, okay? If, I can't even, if, for example, if you're driving or you go going to the DMV, say, okay, you're going to the DMV. Every time you go to the DMV, it's busy, but you're going to the DMV at, 4, 4.35 o'clock, right when you get off of work, when everyone's gotten off of work. Stop going there at that same time and say maybe during lunch or maybe go at 2 or 3 at a different time. So if you know what's causing you stress, stop doing that, okay? You can kind of figure out what's, what the main reason is, okay? You want to also write it down, plan it out, and have everything in its place, okay? So again, write it down. They were saying that when you write it down, your prefrontal cortex is like a filing cabinet. So everything is kind of stored in your brain. If you have a lot of stuff going on, more than likely you're not going to be able to sleep at night. So simply by writing it down, doing a brain dump, it releases that information from the back, goes into the prefrontal cortex, which is like a filing cabinet. So all of a sudden, all this emotional part, everything that's, oh, I can't sleep, I'm so stressed out, just by writing it down, it moves it right in front, and all of a sudden you don't have to worry about it anymore. As simple as just writing stuff down, okay? Plan it out, just making sure you have a plan for what you're doing. Um, and everything in its place, getting organized, okay? If more than likely, if you're not organized, if you don't know where things are, you're going to be more stressed. So try to get as organized as you can, but don't spend too much time on it. Some people trying to get organized, the big thing that they do, they go buy more stuff to get organized. You already have a lot of junk, so let's go buy some more stuff to try to get more organized, which that kind of just counteracts itself. So they recommend try to do a little bit in the morning, spend like, take about 30 minutes of your work day to get organized, about 30 minutes before you leave work and get organized, and that's it, okay? Don't spend more time on that, but just do as little as you can there, those little amounts of time, get as much done as you can, okay? You'll feel a little bit better if you're organized. Um, so the next one is appraise, okay? So it's time to look over, carefully over at everything that's left over. So after you figure out why you're stressed, what's going on, figure out what's left in your life, okay? What else, what other problems, whatever, what other conflicts do you have going on? You want to determine the worth of it, okay? If it's important and urgent, important and not urgent, or not important but you think it's urgent, okay? Or not important and not urgent at all. It's just kind of over there in the side. Okay, so I mean, example, important and urgent would be um, an emergency savings fund, important and not urgent, a kid's college fund, okay? That's important, but if you just had babies, they're not going to college right away, so it's not something that you need to stress about right now. So if you just determine the worth of it, you can kind of determine where your attention needs to be at, okay? Um, next thing, simply consider it all a joy. 10% of life is what happens to us, um, and 90% is how we react, okay? Again, everyone lives life. Everyone is going to have things that come in, that conquer you. But it's how you view it and how you react to it that's going to prevent that stress from coming on, okay? Two more things of the stress model, okay? you got to attune. So attune to others by building a support group, okay? So attune just means to kind of come together, okay? You want to plug in. So, I mean, 
church groups, neighborhood groups, coworkers, friends, family. Just get yourself a good support group going on, okay? You'd be surprised how much that helps, especially if you get in a stressful situation, how much that support system does help you, okay? Um, and they study participants with the fewest social contacts are two to three times more likely to die sooner than those with more. So that sounds kind of morbid, I guess. But it's true. I mean, if you kind of just stay in your house all day, you don't really talk to other people, that communication and that network does a lot for your mental, a lot for your just physical being. So try to get into as many support groups as you can, OK? Um, and last thing of this model is accept. So realize that there may be things we can't do anything about, OK? There might just be some things that it, it is what it is. But you have to accept that. You have to be OK with that, OK? Um, accept the things you can't change. And also know that we're better than we give ourselves credit for. So don't, don't let those little things that you can't change, don't let that stop you. Don't let that prevent you from being who you are and being as good as you are, okay? Give yourself a lot of credit. Okay, so now we're going to jump shift into nutrition, okay? Nutrition plays a huge role in stress management. So the really big nightmare of nutrition, and we'll get into it, but mainly it's depression and stress, inflammation, and most all chronic diseases. So I mean, they're kind of in this circle here. They all affect one another, OK? Um, and inflammation on the brain is caused by oxidation from free radicals, OK? Free radicals are a huge universal brain destructor, OK? They just destroy those, blood, those brain cells. Um, so if we can pull back that inflammation, it's going to stop this nasty little cycle that we have going on here, OK? We're going to talk about that. So. You want to feed your brain the right kinds of fats, okay? Here's the fun stuff. So you want omega-3 fats, okay? These are superstar fats. These help brain structure and help function, okay? They also boost production of brain proteins, actually help make new brain cells. They've been saying for years and years, once you kill brain cells, it's over. You've lost brain cells, you can't get them back, but they're finding by diet, you can make new brain cells, okay? So it's really fun stuff that they're finding. Um, Omega-3s are also powerful antioxidants. So those antioxidants fight against those free radicals. Okay, so free radicals cause, again, killing brain cells. Antioxidants come and combat them to where those free radicals are just pretty much out of the way, okay? Um, it helps control inflammation. And omega-3s have a healthy blood flow throughout the brain. So where do, we find, where do you find these omega-3s? Okay, you can find them in oily fish. Sorry if you can't read that, it's kind of small up there. Oily fish, so salmon, tuna, mackerel, herring, sardines, black cod, lake trout. Okay, fish have a lot of magnesium, B12, vitamin B, zinc, and choline. Okay, so they're really nutritious. And wild salmon is one of the best sources of fish that you can have for the omega-3s. Okay, they recommend that you try for three or more weekly servings of, I mean, of fish, of omega-3s. But again, if you love salmon, have salmon three times a week, okay? Um, walnuts are also good, canola oil, flax, chai, and hemp seeds, omega-3 eggs, wheat germ, whole soy foods, and small leafy greens like oregula. Or, yeah. Okay. Um, another kind is monounsaturated fats. Okay, so extra virgin olive oil, canola oil, nuts, again, walnuts, avocado. So these, again, are going to what's going to help boost those new brain cells. Okay. I mean, if you think if your brain... If you've lost brain cells, you've done stuff, if your brain's going to be kind of foggy, kind of not feeling, you're not feeling your best, you're going to be more likely to get more stress in your life, okay? I mean, if you're not, you're not in the right state of mind, if something comes and happens, you're not going to be able to fight and combat that, okay? So these are huge to help boost those new brain cells. So these are the ones you want to avoid. These are toxic to the brain, okay? Trans fats, so parsley hydrogenated oils, oxidized fats. So deep fried foods, those ones that taste so good, KFC, French fries, all that, they're horrible for the brain, okay? Smoking, smoking oils, rancid or stale fats, um, saturated omega-6 fats are bad, so those are going to be in vegetable oils, corn, like soybean, safflower, um, standard beef and pork, okay, those have, um, those aren't very good for your brain either. And red meat, whole dairy products, and butter. Okay, those are okay to have, but if you have high amounts of them, that's when they're going to start being toxic to your body, okay? So, I mean, like steak, pork, 
um, ribs, ribs that are so good, okay? Maybe only have those like once a week or something. They're not horrible, but don't overconsume them, okay? Um, and omega-6 fats compete with omega-3 fats, okay? So this is pretty interesting. So there, it's actually a one-for-one one battle, okay? So the more omega-6 you have, the less that the good fat, the omega-3, can actually work, okay? So if you have one of each, they're going to just X each other out, okay? Um, and omega-6 is a pro-inflammatory fat, so it's going to cause inflammation in the brain, which, again, we don't want. So they recommend that you want one to four servings of omega-3, the good fat, to one serving of omega-6, the bad fat, okay? So make sure that omega-3s are staying in charge, okay? They're not getting cut out by the bad omega-6, okay? Um, going on to carbs. So good carbs, we want 100% whole grains. They're more slowly digested. They're a great brain fuel. Um, they also have, again, those antioxidants, which we want in the brain. It combats those free radicals, and it boosts your serotonin. So when your serotonin, um, when your ser when your serotonin is not high, sorry, when it's not high, I didn't mean to say when it's too high. So when it's hi not high, your prefrontal cortex calms down, which makes you make bad decisions. Okay. So if you don't have enough serotonin, your again that front part of your brain is going to kind of relax a little bit, and you're going to make worse decisions. Okay. It's just not going to be able to think of, as well. It's not going to be able to um, regulate everything, which again, making bad decisions is going to cause you to have what? Stress, right? If you do something silly, you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to feel silly about it. You're going to be stressed out, okay? Um, so another good carbs is beans, any type, um, in all forms, sorry, not tip, any type, and also brown carbs. So brown rice, wheat bread, etc. okay? Looking for that brown stuff. Bad carbs, I mean, just opposite of that, white flour, white rice, sugar and sweets. So what happens when you eat those bad carbs? Your glucose rises, okay? So a lot of carb intake, that glucose comes up. Your, the molecules react with a protein, which is, again, going to create some free radicals, which we don't want. Free radicals are bad, okay? So what happens when that glucose rises? The insulin is going to come in, and it needs to bring the, your glucose back down, okay? Insulin is a fat hormone. Higher insulin... It's going to be easier to gain weight and harder to lose weight, which, again, what would that cause? Stress, right? If you're stressed, you're trying, you're exercising, you're doing everything you can, you just can't lose that weight, you keep packing on the pounds, I'm going to be stressed out if that's happening to me too. So, I mean, what goes up must come down. So when glucose goes down, you're going to get hungry, okay, which can cause, I mean, fear, anxiety, cause stress. If you're constantly hungry, constantly eating, again, it's going to cause that stress to come on. Okay, so that's all caused by those bad carbs, that reaction that the body happens, that the body does from eating those bad carbs. Okay, fruit and vegetables. So these are fun things, both loaded with nutrients and antioxidants. Okay, it helps boost the brain and makes you feel less stressed. See color, think brainy, okay? Those deep colors are going to be really good for the brain and your stress levels. So blue, red, purple fruits have the highest amount of antioxidants. So, I mean, berries, pomegranates, cherries, um, and dark leafy greens, again, are good. So spinach, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, okay? The deeper the color, the better it is for stress levels, for brain, for everything in the body. It has all those high antioxidants. Okay, enough nutrition. We're going to talk about fun stuff, some chocolate, okay? So less stress tip. So vitamin D. So this is a huge thing for stress. So sun exposure helps reduce your stress levels by 60 to 70%, okay, just from getting out. So I don't really know how people live in Alaska. <laughs> I have a friend who lives out there, and I, I need my sun. So the sun feels good. So, but it does amazing things for your stress levels, okay? Um, vitamin D foods. So if you don't want to go outside as much, you can get vitamin D from foods. Oily fish, egg yolks, mushrooms, fortified dairy. Okay, if you are insufficient in vitamin D, you can take supplements. There are supplements that's better than nothing. Okay, supplements aren't always recommended very much because the natural thing's better, but they do have vitamin D supplements that are still really, really good for your body. Okay, but low vitamin D, what's going to happen? You're going to have more pain, stress, fatigue, depression, cognitive decline, and a higher chance of those autoimmune diseases. So MS, Parkinson's, etc. Okay, so just by simply getting out, getting some sunshine, 
it's going to help you. But make sure you wear sunscreen because we don't want to get skin cancer from going outside too much. So wear the sunscreen when you do go outside. Okay, um, tee it up. So tea has a very high amount of antioxidants, okay? It's really calming, okay? It's best if it's freshly brewed, hot green or white tea with a twist of lemon. Okay, get some lemon in there. It's really good for your body. Okay, dark chocolate. If you guys are chocolate lovers, eat dark chocolate, okay? It's amazing how much antioxidants are in the dark chocolate. Um, it increases your blood flow, increases your mood and focus. So they recommend to get up to one ounce daily. So probably that whole chocolate bar would be more than one ounce, okay? So don't eat the whole chocolate bar, but if you just need a little, if you have a sweet tooth, you need a little bit of chocolate, dark chocolate is as good as you can get, okay? Um, go as dark as you can tolerate. So try for about 70% or higher. It might take a little bit to get a taste for it, but dark chocolate's really good for you, okay? And there's also good anti-inflammatory drugs, okay? Um, ginger, turmeric, curry, garlic, and cinnamon, okay? Those things are actually really good for you. If you like to add a little bit of spice, okay, add some ginger, garlic, cinnamon. If you eat oatmeal in the morning, put a little, a little cinnamon on it, and it's going to help the brain, the inflammation in your brain. It's going to help your stress levels. Okay, so those spices can do a lot of things for your stress. Oh, I didn't mean to. Add. Okay, good. Okay, so healthy boundaries, okay? It is okay to whine about your problems, okay? It's okay. It's natural. You're going to have stress. You're going to have problems. It's okay to whine about it, okay? So they recommend give yourself about five minutes to whine to your husband, wife, friend, coworker, and then stop, okay? That's it. After those five minutes of whining, go back and say something positive about whatever you just were whining about. It might seem hard at first, but it actually helps. It's always good to change that perspective, okay? Get all those bad thoughts out. Say... My coworker is just driving me nuts. I can't do anything right. Yada da da da. After I'd be like, but you know what? They're actually trying. It's amazing what that little change of perspective can actually do for the brain, for those stress levels, everything. Okay. So give yourself time to whine, but then change it. Um, another tip is give yourself, make yourself a survival kit. Okay. So find things that are comfort, your comfort to stress. Okay. So they recommend take these five senses and write down what's comforting to each, okay? So sight, hear, touch, taste, and smell, okay? All those different senses. If you can just get a piece of paper down, write all those senses out, and just list what's comforting to your sight, okay? Is seeing a waterfall or seeing a beach out on the ocean, envision, envisioning yourself out on the beach, okay? What is comforting to your sight? So if it's something sight, take a picture or print out a picture, put that in the survival kit, okay? Here, if you like to listen to classical music or if you like rock and roll, I don't know if that would be comforting, but if you like that, get a little like iPod or a little CD, put that in your survival kit, okay? So these things are, if you feel yourself getting really stressed, pull these, the, your little survival kit out and do something, okay? Even if it's a little piece of chocolate or a lollipop or whatever that's comforting to taste, put that in there, okay? But make sure... If you take it out, you put it back in. So if you eat your, all your chocolate, you open up your survival kit, and all your chocolate's gone, you might be a little bit more stressed out, okay? So make sure you always refill the chocolate if you take it out. But, I mean, having a little survival kit, again, even if you, in your mind, you don't think, I'm not under a lot of stress, I'm okay, that little bit of stress constantly throughout your life, if you're not managing it, again, you, we've, you've seen in this how in the long term it's going to still have an effect on you, okay? So it's important to do these little things. So relaxation, okay? We know there's different types of relaxation, okay? There's um, deep breathing, progressive relaxation, body awareness. We have mental imagery, meditation, yoga, tai chi. You can even get a little massage if you want, okay? Lots of different types of relaxation there, okay? So we're going to give you a little example. We're going to do a relaxation, okay? This is the last thing of the, the um, brown bag. Um, Participation is voluntary. If you don't want to participate, you're fine. Some people have different views about it. Um, but we are going to, I'm going to play some relaxation music. Okay, so I just would like you to close your eyes, get comfortable, and I'm just going to read this nice little script for us and kind of, it's going to be a progressive relaxation. Okay, so the muscle relaxation, what it's going to be, just letting you know, it's going to be relaxing your muscles. Okay, so you're going to be tensing your muscles and relax, tense and relax, kind of going back and forth there. Okay, it shouldn't take too long, so 
let me get the music going. And again, if you don't want to participate, oh, I don't want to do that. Participate, that's okay. Oh, why won't it play? Sorry, gotta get it to play. This was supposed to just go right into it. Oh well. Do you guys have any questions while I try to get this up? Anybody? Okay. Okay. So a little relaxation music for you. Again, go ahead and close your eyes. Okay, can we dim the lights at all? Do they dim? Let me turn this down just a little bit. So even out on the sites, if you guys want to do it, go ahead, let's do it. And I feel really good. All right. So I want you to begin just by finding a comfortable position, sitting, standing, or lying down. You can change positions anytime during the relaxation to make yourself more comfortable as needed. The first exercise is breathing. Breathe in forcefully and deeply and hold this first breath. Hold it, hold it, and now release. Let all the air go out slowly and release all the tension. Take another deep breath in, hold it, and then exhale slowly, allowing the tension to leave your body with the air. Now breathe even more slowly and gently. Breathe in, hold, and out. Continue to breathe slowly and gently. Allow your breathing to relax you. We're gonna now focus on relaxing the muscles of the body. Start with the large muscles of your legs. Tighten all the muscles of your legs. Tense the muscles further. Hold on to this tension. Feel how tight and tense the muscles in your legs are right now. Squeeze the muscles harder, tighter. Continue to hold this tension. Feel the muscles wanting to give up. Hold it for a few moments more. And now relax. Let all the tension go. Feel the muscles in your legs going limp, loose, and relaxed. Notice how relaxed the muscles feel now. Feel the difference between tension and relaxation and enjoy the pleasant feeling of relaxation in your legs. Now focus on the muscles in your arms. Tighten your shoulders, upper arms, lower arms, and hands. Squeeze your hands into tight fists. Tense the muscles in your arms and hands as tightly as you can. Squeeze harder. Hold the tension in your arms, shoulders, and hands. Feel the tension in these muscles and hold it for a few more moments. And now release. Let the muscles of your shoulders, arms, and hands relax and go limp. Feel the relaxation as your shoulders lower into a comfortable position and your hands relax at your side. Allow the muscles in your arms to relax completely. Tighten the muscles of your back now. Feel your back tightening, pulling. Your shoulders are back and tensing the muscles along your spine. 
Arch your back slightly as you tighten these muscles. Hold. And relax. Let all the tension go. And feel your back comfortably relaxing into a good and healthy position. Finally, tighten the muscles of your face. Scrunch your eyes, shut tightly. Wrinkle your nose and tighten your cheeks and your chin. Hold this tension in your face and relax. Release all the tension. Feel how relaxed your face is. Now notice all the muscles in your body. Notice how relaxed your muscles feel. Allow any last bit of tension to drain away. Enjoy the relaxation you're experiencing. Notice your calm breathing, your relaxed muscles. Enjoy the relaxation for a few moments. When you are ready to return to your usual level of alertness and awareness, slowly begin to reawaken the body. Wiggle your toes and fingers. Swing your arms gently. Shrug your shoulders. And stretch. The relaxation exercise is over and you now feel calm and refreshed. Good. How do you feel? Does that feel good? Oh, thank you. I don't know how to turn the lights back on, but we're almost done. Okay, so that was just, again, an example. Okay, an example of a relaxation. And if you do choose to continue doing these, um, I did print out some copies of these if you want them. But there's lots and lots of different scripts online for relaxation. But they do recommend that you give um, each session about a two-week trial period. Okay, so I mean, if you try some of these, if you try, oh no, if you try some of the relaxation exercises and they feel funny, they feel kind of weird to you, okay, just to try it a few times, see if you like it. Um, but there's yoga classes, again, those Tai Chi classes that you can take. Um, there's lots of different types of relaxation as well, okay? And a massage, getting like an hour-long massage is so relaxing, okay? That will feel really good on the body. And again, the, the level that it helps those stress, the stress levels is huge, okay? Just allowing your body to relax, allowing yourself just to kind of escape whatever is going on and just relax. It's, it's amazing what it does for you. So, okay, so that's it. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for recruiting a few of your friends. <laughs> Um, if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me, okay? My name, um, email, nicole.jackson at usu.edu. That's my phone number as well here at um, 797-1807, okay? Um, but like I said, this was just kind of barely breaking the tip of the iceberg here. There's lots of more information, so hopefully if people are interested, we could do another session, but it just depends, and we'll see. Do you guys have any questions out on the side?